Why did Martin Heidegger refuse having his works translated from the German language? Heidegger had a strong bias in favor of German as the language of thought. He did not think that his philosophy could be understood by those who did not speak German. And would not permit his work to be translated into Spanish. Why did Martin Heidegger refuse having his works translated from the German language? Heidegger had a strong bias in favor of German as the language of thought. He did not think that his philosophy could be understood by those who did not speak German. And would not permit his work to be translated into Spanish. What was Martin Heidegger's question concerning technology? Heidegger's question was the same question that hangs over us at this time. Will technology destroy the world as we know it? But Heidegger's understanding of technology was unlike environmentalist. Thought that distinguished the artificial from what is natural. As part of what it means to say that the world worlds, Heidegger believed that technology was a process arising from being. Insofar as human beings are the custodians of being in their own being. Albeit without a full understanding of what is involved in their relationship to being. Technology, according to Heidegger, was an enframing force and process that emerges from Dossian's relationship to being, all beings are marshaled and regimented to present themselves as uniform types of objects, human activities and the beauties of nature are also enframed and presented back to Dossian as items for use or consumption. In Heidegger's terms, a particularly plaintive example of such processing is the redirection and artificialization of the River Rhine as a tourist attraction. As part of his analysis of the historical force of technology that has arisen from a distinctively human understanding of being, Heidegger insists that technology is not an effect of science, but the reverse. Science and scientific research are no more than the results of more general technological forces. What was Martin Heidegger's question concerning technology? Heidegger's question was the same question that hangs over us at this time. Will technology destroy the world as we know it? But Heidegger's understanding of technology was unlike environmentalist. Thought that distinguished the artificial from what is natural. As part of what it means to say that the world worlds, Heidegger believed that technology was a process arising from being. Insofar as human beings are the custodians of being in their own being. Albeit without a full understanding of what is involved in their relationship to being. Technology, according to Heidegger, was an enframing force and process that emerges. From Dossian's relationship to being, all beings are marshaled and regimented to 
present themselves as uniform types of objects, human activities and the beauties of nature are also enframed and presented back to Dacian as items for use or consumption. In Heidegger's terms, a particularly plaintive example of such processing is the redirection and artificialization of the River Rhine as a tourist attraction. As part of his analysis of the historical force of technology that has arisen from a distinctively human understanding of being, Heidegger insists that technology is not an effect of science, but the reverse. Science and scientific research are no more than the results of more general technological forces. Who was Maurice Merleau-Ponty? Maurice Merleau-Ponty, 1908-1961 Was an anti-empiricist who sought to reconstruct the world based on a phenomenology of human perception. He was influenced by Edmund Husserl, 1859-1938, was friends with Jean-Paul Sartre. 1905-1980, for a while, and continues to be of great interest to phenomenological philosophers of mind. His principal works are The Phenomenology of Perception, 1945. Numerous essays, and his unfinished The Visible and the Invisible. Who was Maurice Merleau-Ponty? Maurice Merleau-Ponty, 1908-1961 Was an anti-empiricist who sought to reconstruct the world based on a phenomenology of human perception. He was influenced by Edmund Husserl, 1859-1938, was friends with Jean-Paul Sartre. 1905-1980, for a while, and continues to be of great interest to phenomenological philosophers of mind. His principal works are The Phenomenology of Perception, 1945. Numerous essays, and his unfinished The Visible and the Invisible. What was Franz Brentano's psychological theory of right and wrong? Brentano thought that judgments can be correct or incorrect and that the same held for loving and hating. If a thing is good, then it is impossible to love it incorrectly. Correctness in loving and hating is objective, as is incorrectness. Brentano was an intuitionist concerning such correctness. He thought that we could be immediately and directly aware of the fit between the emotion and the object. 1859-1938, the founder of phenomenology, and Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, the father of psychoanalysis. He was ordained as a Roman Catholic priest in 1864, but renounced his vows after engaging in a dispute about papal infallibility. He resigned his professorship at the University of Vienna so that he could marry, and was not able to regain that position. Later years left him blind. But he continued to write in virtually every subfield of philosophy until he died. 
Brentano's principal writings are psychology from an empirical point of view. 1874, and our knowledge of the origin of right and wrong, 1889. Beauvoir-Influential-as-a-Feminist。Writing-at-a-time-when-women-did-not-have-a-recognized-voice-in-public-life-they-had-only-received-the-right-to-vote-in-1944-in-France-or-opportunities-to-pursue-professions。Beauvoir offered a comprehensive account and analysis of the position of women in Western society with a focus on their life stages. For women, unlike men, biology is destiny, she said. She was not particularly sympathetic to the subordinate condition of women. Generally, because she thought that they too easily accepted their secondary passive roles in comparison to the leading. Active roles allowed and expected of men. Beauvoir did not clearly indicate ways in which women could realize their human freedoms and transcend their object-like status, or imminence. As human beings who were not only objectified by men, but who seemed too content to objectify themselves. However, she began a trend in social and political activism, as well as intellectual life. Which recognized and addressed the ways in which women were the second sex. What was Peter Kropotkin's view of Darwinism in society? Kropotkin did not think that competition was a good survival strategy. Whether in the animal or human worlds. In his Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, 1902, he wrote the following. In the animal world we have seen that the vast majority of species live in societies, and that they find in association the best arms for the struggle for life. Understood, of course, in its wide Darwinian sense not as a struggle for the sheer means of existence. But as a struggle against all natural conditions unfavorable to the species. The animal species, in which individual struggle has been reduced to its narrowest limits. And the practice of mutual aid has attained the greatest development. Are invariably the most numerous, the most prosperous, and the most open to further progress. The mutual protection which is obtained in this case, the possibility of attaining old age and of accumulating experience. The higher intellectual development, and the further growth of sociable habits. Secure the maintenance of the species, its extension, and its further progressive evolution. The unsociable species, on the contrary, are doomed to decay. However, Kropotkin did hold that revolution is part of human evolution and that anarchism was a return to a condition that had been distorted by modern repressive institutions. Because human beings are naturally social, government is unnecessary. Was Alexius Menung serious about non-existent objects? Yes, and it cost his reputation dearly, 
because Bertrand Russell. 1872-1970, was to make great fun of him for it in his famous article on denoting, 1905. Still, other 20th century philosophers, such as Terence Parsons, 1939, and Roderick Chisholm, 1916 to 1999, were to defend the consistency of meanings. Ontology and the usefulness of being able to talk about non existent objects. Meinung believed that non existent objects include the merely possible, as well as the impossible. He thought that existence was just a property of objects, like smell or shape. So that, for example, fictional characters lack that property, while Meinung himself had it. What was Jean-Paul Sartre's basis for his idea of freedom? Sartre argued that freedom was inherent in the very structure of human consciousness. To be conscious is to be free. Consciousness has no prior cause but is a spontaneous upsurge. Consciousness is nothing in itself, because it is always aware of something other than itself. Consciousness is freedom. Thus, consciousness is not a thing in itself. Sartre called consciousness the for itself, or pour soi, and everything else is the in itself. Or en soi. At first glance, his division of the human cosmos into for itself and in itself resembles René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, doctrine of mental and physical substance. But Sartre went beyond Descartes' idea of the mental substance. For Sartre, as his hero in Nausea, 1938, discovers in the course of a research project. Even a person's past meritorious acts or traits of character have the status of ensoi. It is a form of bad faith. For example, to pretend that one is determined to fulfill his or her duty because that is how he or she was raised. Or that one's laziness makes disciplined work impossible. People are responsible for allowing their own background, weaknesses or strengths to be motives for action in the immediate present. Why do some people consider Martin Heidegger to be an existentialist? In Being and Time, 1927, Heidegger analyzed the human being or Dasein, which in German means being there. Heidegger's insight was that Dasein cannot be understood as a biological thing because its main objects of concern, which is a fundamental structure of what it is, are always somewhere other than where Dasein itself is. Although Dasein in its being is concerned for its own being. Understood in the ordinary sense as life, its own being is caught up in the world. Furthermore, Dasein fails to understand its own being authentically, because in its ordinary existence it accepts the interpretation of its being that has already been constructed by the they, or the mass mind. The they is particularly mistaken about the nature of death.
What were Friedrich Nietzsche's views on religion? In Beyond Good and Evil, 1886, The Genealogy of Morals, 1887, and The Antichrist, 1888. Nietzsche described Christianity as a sickly ethics of weak people's resentment of the strong. He thought that before Christianity blonde beasts had become Masters of their subjects through daring acts of ferocity. That ancient ruling class was naturally cruel to those not as strong. These fierce rulers saw their weak subjects as base, while their own traits of pride, courage, reverence for tradition, and loyalty to one another constituted their virtues. The old aristocratic system of values was in time destroyed through the machinations of a priestly class. Which denied itself by turning its cruelty inward. And encouraged the oppressed masses to identify what hurt them as morally bad evil. Christianity was thus a slave morality in Nietzsche's opinion. Its uselessness for living fully evident in the worship of a slain god and a rejection of earthly vitality for hopes of joy in heaven. He thought that Christianity was a powerless religion for powerless people. A slave religion with a slave morality for slaves. But he cautioned the strong, one has to test oneself to see that one is destined for independence and command and do it at the right time. One should not dodge one's tests, though they may be the most dangerous game one can. Play and our tests that are taken in the end before no witness or judge but ourselves. What was Alexius Menung's psychological theory? Menung divided mental experience into act, content, and object. He worked on the basis of Brentano's theory of intentionality, whereby all mental states intend objects. The mental act, or act element, is the way that the subject is directed toward the object. Whereas the specific content, or content element, is its focus in that case. For example, it is a different act to think of an apple versus to desire an apple. Thinking of an apple and thinking of a car is a difference in content. And going from one to the other is a change in focus. Menung's object theory bypassed traditional ontology because as intended objects. In the sense of Franz Brentano 1837-1917, it was not necessary that all objects exist. In fact, Menung stressed a bias toward existence in the history of metaphysics, which he called a prejudice in favor of the actual. Each object has a socian, or character, which is given through its nuclear features. Because objects truly possess their characters, even statements about non-existent objects can be true. Because how objects are is independent of their existence. For example, a pink unicorn is genuinely pink, even though unicorns do not exist. Who was Jean-Paul Sartre?
Jean-Paul Charles Imard Sartre, 1905-1980, was the icon of 20th century existentialism. Popular versions of his ideas gave existentialism its dark glamour of atheistic, nihilistic, cigarette smoking, absent drinking, cafe frequenting. French intellectuals, arguing about ideas, and practicing free love. Sartre himself smoked a pipe, was short, stocky, nearsighted, and wallied. He was well known by his contemporaries for his work in the French resistance against the Nazis. And later on, for his Marxism and opposition to the Vietnam conflict. Sartre refused to accept the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1964 on the grounds of his political objections to the bourgeois militaristic culture that made such a prize possible. Sartre's main existentialist works consisted of numerous plays and essays. The novel Nausea, 1938, and the philosophical works The Imagination, 1936. The Transcendence of the Ego, 1937, and Being and Nothingness, 1943. His Marxism was developed in the uncompleted. Three-volume work The Critique of Dialectical Reason, 1958-1959 What was Jean-Paul Sartre's version of existentialism? Sartre was an atheist. So he began with the premise that man is alone in the world and there is no higher power. There is no fixed human nature because man is the inventor of the very idea of nature, man makes himself. This ability to make oneself is accompanied by a responsibility for what one makes. And it leads to considerable anguish because one must choose what to be on one's own. The living human being is always in a situation of varying degrees of difficulty from which there is no escape. Others are also present in one's life, of course, and they have the same kind of freedoms you do. Which renders cooperative and lastingly loving human relationships extremely difficult. One can never fully see the other as he or she is to himself or herself. Because others are in the same situation, the net effect is that hell is other people. Sartre's view of intimate relationships was bleak because the person desired always eludes being the object desired. The desired person can never fully become an object because he or she has their own freedom. To accept one's freedom and one's situation, or facticity, are both necessary in order to be in good faith. The person who lives in bad faith either denies his own freedom and responsibility or denies the reality of his situation. Everything is chosen, even emotions that carry one to extremes, or insanity. Even the most difficult situation, which one has not chosen, does not negate one's freedom. It is the individual who gives the situation the meaning it has for him or her as a difficult situation. With a gun to one's head, for instance, one still has the choice of whether or not to live.
What is the they? Martin Heidegger's term the they was meant to refer to ordinary people who go about their everyday lives with no philosophical awareness of their existence. What was philosophically significant about 19th century psychology and social theory? In the 19th century, the foundations were laid for psychology and sociology to develop as distinct fields separate from philosophy. The reasons for their separation are differences in subject matter as well as methodology. Concerning the latter, Wilhelm Dilthey, 1833-1911, put the case of his age best in claiming that human sciences such as history, psychology, philology and philosophy were characterized by a need to understand, whereas the physical sciences sought causes. However, in the 20th century, quantitative methodology and experiments in search of causes were to characterize important parts of both psychology and sociology. Quantification and causal explanation were also to characterize economics, which did not become distinctly independent from political philosophy, sociology, and philosophy until the 20th century. But in the 19th century, the establishment of psychology and sociology as separate from epistemology, ethics, and political philosophy, as well as revolutionary critique, was a major achievement. What were the ideas of the main religious existentialists? Martin Buber 1878-1965, connected existentialism to Judaism by emphasizing that whereas Christians have direct individual relationships to God, the Jewish relationship to God is mediated by membership in a community. As a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, after he left Vienna in 1938, Buber tried to reconcile Jews and Arabs. Buber criticized the subject-object form of knowledge as a mode in both human and religious relationships. In its place, he advocated an I-Thou relationship that recognized the subjectivity of the other. His main work is I and Thou, 1923. Carl Jaspers, 1883-1969, thought that philosophy should help human beings with their projects of self-discovery toward a goal of existence, or authentic selfhood, based on an understanding of one's own life. Although not a traditional theologian, Jaspers nevertheless addressed individual spiritual yearnings. His main works are Philosophy, 1932, On the Origin and Goal of History, 1949, and Way to Wisdom, 1950. Gabriel Marcel, 1889-1973, was both a philosopher and a playwright who addressed human existence in terms of community and personal relationships. He emphasized we are, instead of I am, drawing on both Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, and Buber. 
He also approached philosophy as a Bergsonian intuitionist by relying on his immediate insights for his views. Rather than arriving at them through argument. His main works include Mystery of Being, 1951, and Man Against Mass Society, 1955. His William James Lectures at Harvard University, 1961, 1962. Were published as the existential background of human dignity. Simone Weil, 1909 to 1943, was born into a Jewish Parisian family but converted first to leftist syndicalism, which was a Marxist political movement with the goal of putting labor unions in control of both industry and government. Her subsequent religious thought was a combination of Neoplatonism, Christianity, and Jewish mysticism. She was an activist on behalf of the democratically elected government during the Spanish Civil War and for the French resistance during World War II. She criticized the way in which Marxism had become a religion. To some and objected to the dehumanizing effects of capitalism. Her solution was meaningful work as a fundamental human need. Her main writings, published posthumously, are Gravity and Grace, 1947, and Oppression and Liberty, 1955. Why did Martin Heidegger refuse having his works translated from the German language? Heidegger had a strong bias in favor of German as the language of thought. He did not think that his philosophy could be understood by those who did not speak German and would not permit his work to be translated into Spanish. What was Martin Heidegger's question concerning technology? Heidegger's question was the same question that hangs over us at this time. Will technology destroy the world as we know it? But Heidegger's understanding of technology was unlike environmentalist. Thought that distinguished the artificial from what is natural. As part of what it means to say that the world worlds, Heidegger believed that technology was a process arising from being. Insofar as human beings are the custodians of being in their own being. Albeit without a full understanding of what is involved in their relationship to being. Technology, according to Heidegger, was an enframing force and process that emerges. From Dossian's relationship to being, all beings are marshaled and regimented to present themselves as uniform types of objects, human activities and the beauties of nature are also enframed and presented back to Dossian as items for use or consumption. In Heidegger's terms, a particularly plaintive example of such processing is the redirection and artificialization of the River Rhine as a tourist attraction. As part of his analysis of the historical force of technology that has arisen from a distinctively human understanding of being. Heidegger insists that technology is not an effect of science, but the reverse. Science and scientific research are no more than the results of more general technological forces.
Who was Sigmund Freud? Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, was the founder of psychoanalytic theory and clinical practice. He developed the idea that early childhood experience has a lifelong influence in shaping personality and character. The importance of childhood education was emphasized as early as Plato. C 428 C 348 BCE, but Freud was the first to stress childhood emotional experience. Freud was also responsible for the popular acceptance of the idea that self-understanding does not occur immediately and automatically, but requires a special kind of reflection. The ancient Greeks are famous for the maxim, know thyself. But Freud's distinct contribution was that there are different layers of the self to be known. Freud's principal works are The Interpretation of Dreams, 1900. Three Essays on the Theory of Sexuality, 1905, and Civilization and Its Discontents, 1930. Also of particular interest in his application of his theories to Healthy people in ordinary life is psychopathology of everyday life, 1901. What were Martin Heidegger's views on death? Heidegger thought that the individual's death had to be wrested away from the they. Who made of death something impersonal that was ordinary, but which somehow didn't happen to anyone in particular. Heidegger claimed that death is in each case my own and that authentic existence requires an attitude of anticipatory resoluteness toward one's own death. It is nothing less than conscience, the call of care, which draws a person to attend to his or her own death. The problem is that dossier cannot be completed until dossier is no more. But when Dacian is no more, Dacian will no longer be as a concrete individual. And furthermore, its own death is a nothing. Heidegger took this to mean that we are constantly being called to a nullity. In a paradoxical need to authentically be that which we most fully are. This nullity in the essence of Dacian, which in Heidegger's terminology is always outstanding. So long as Dacian is, creates a primordial anxiety in Dacian. Heidegger meant that the fact that our death is always in the future is what makes us always anxious. But of course, if our death were in the present, we would no longer exist. So we mortals have to put up with the fact that we will die as something that we are always aware of while we are alive. What kind of a Marxist was Jean-Paul Sartre? In his Introduction to the Critique of Dialectical Reason, 1960, Sartre first claimed that his own existentialist philosophy was merely an addendum to Marxism as an historical process. But when he went on to explain what he meant, he said that the success of Marxist liberation for the oppressed would be necessary for the freedom he had described to be accessible to everyone. 
In other words, he saw the goal of Marxism as the realization of the very freedom he had described. In one sense, this contradicted his description of freedom as a universal human condition. But in another sense, Sartre believed that the oppressed have the power. Based on their individual freedom, to unite and cooperate for collective liberation. So, although he embraced Marxism, he did not embrace its premise of determinism that the individual's consciousness is the result of the political and economic factors forming his or her social class. What was Alexius Menung's theory of value? Our emotions and desires have a cognitive ability to discern value. This does not mean that our emotions and desires can think but that. They tell us something about the world, often faster than our minds. Objects those things intended by us present themselves with value features. For instance, the smell of the apple directs me to eat it it has the value of being good to eat. Or a sunset presents itself as beautiful. A property that does not reduce to facts about the refraction of light or the amount of pollution in the air. There are also value universals, such as the good, the beautiful, the agreeable, the desirable, and different kinds of the obligatory, the general category of our duties. Menung distinguished between dignitatives that are associated with ideas of the good and desideratives associated with ideas of duty. What was Franz Brentano's main contribution to empirical psychology? Brentano's lasting importance lies in his emphasis on the intentionality of conscious states and attitudes. He pointed out that thoughts, beliefs, hopes, desires, and the like which Bertrand Russell 1872 to 1970, was to term propositional attitudes are directed towards some object. For instance, if you are thinking about an apple then your intentional object is the apple you are thinking about. If you want a new car, it is the car you intend as an object of that desire. Because physical states are not intentional in this way. Intentionality is a basis on which what is mental can be distinguished from what is physical. Brentano identified three different kinds of intending. Ideas, judgments, and the phenomena of love and hate. The last, also known as emotions and volitions, are directly related to morality. Although an earlier version of Brentano's doctrine called Immanent Intentionality suggested that the object intended was in some way literally in the mind. He later explained that although there is always a mental object for consciousness the object need not literally exist. The point is that one can think of a thing that does not exist. Objects of thought that do exist have strict relations with other objects that exist, whereas those that do not exist lack them. Who was Simone de Beauvoir?
Simone de Beauvoir, 1908-1986, is now most famous as the philosopher who began the second wave of feminism in the West. She began writing when she was eight years old and was a novelist and political writer who helped Jean-Paul Sartre, 1905-1980, her main lifelong companion, found L. E. Monde. De Beauvoir's major works include the novels She Came to Stay, 1943, The Blood of Others, 1945, and The Mandarins, 1954, and her philosophical texts The Ethics of Ambiguity. 1947, The Second Sex, 1949, and Old Age, 1970. She also wrote evocative autobiographical works, such as Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter, 1958. De Beauvoir ruthlessly described Sartre's great decline toward the end of his life in Adieu. A Farewell to Sartre, 1981 Beauvoir also quarreled fiercely with Arlette Elkham, the young Jewish Algerian student who had contacted Sartre when she was 18. Sartre enjoyed discussing his philosophy with Elkham. And he preferred to write in her apartment, instead of following his lifetime habit of writing in cafes. Then he adopted her and bought her a house in the south of France, which became their summer vacation home. Beauvoir had an adopted daughter of her own, Sylvie L. E. Bon de Beauvoir, with whom she had had an erotic relationship, although Sylvie later described it as platonic. Sylvie wrote Tete et Tete, 2005, about de Beauvoir and Sartre. In 2005, Sylvie and Sartre's daughter were not on speaking terms, each in her 60s. They continued to bitterly contest their respective rights to Sartre and de Beauvoir's literary properties. Since Sartre and de Beauvoir are inextricably linked through letters in which they discussed each other. The complexity of the dispute between their literary air essays can only be imagined. By 2005, Sylvie was a retired philosophy teacher and Arlette was described as extremely reclusive. Geographically, these women had lived close to each other in the same Parisian arrondissement, for some years. Beauvoir had a high tolerance for alcohol all her life. She liked its taste but drank more heavily in her later years. She was also hooked on amphetamines. When she died in 1986, she was buried in Sartre's grave, thereby sealing their link for posterity. What are some important facts about Martin Heidegger's life? Heidegger was born in 1889 in the Black Forest in Meskirch, Germany. An area to which he maintained close ties throughout his life. He attended gymnasium, high school, in Freiburg, beginning in 1906, where he read Franz Brentano's 1837-1917, on the manifold meaning of being according to Aristotle, 1862. He intended to become a Jesuit priest, but he was rejected. So he prepared for the Catholic priesthood at Ludwig University in Freiburg. He read the works of Edmund Husserl, 1859-1938, their end. 
at the urging of his teachers, changed from theology to philosophy and mathematics. After marrying Elfried Petrie in March 1917, he joined the German army. Advancing rapidly to corporal, although he was discharged for reasons of health. As Husserl's assistant and a colleague of Karl Jaspers, 1883-1969, Heidegger was successful in philosophy. Becoming an associate professor at the University of Marburg, where he wrote Being and Time. 1927, in a matter of months to secure that post. After this work. He experienced the well-known care, or turn in thought, which led to his an introduction to metaphysics, 1953. Among his students were future philosopher Herbert Marcuse, 1898-1979, and political theorist and philosopher Hannah Arendt. 1906-1975, who became his lover before she had to leave Germany. As a Jewish intellectual, it became evident that she was in danger. After being questioned by the Gestapo the German secret police. During this time, Heidegger was influenced by Lao Tzu's work on meditation. Which led to his own understanding of being through language. Heidegger became rector of the University of Freiburg. In 1933 and was a member of the National Socialist Party. In 1945, the French military government removed his professorship. Although he was able to gain emeritus status, provided he did not teach again. He had a nervous breakdown in 1946 but wrote his letter on humanism to make it clear that Regarding his study of being, his work was not as humanistic as Jean-Paul Sartre. 1905-1980, and other existentialists had mistakenly assumed. In 1950 his professorship was restored, and in 1951 he was allowed to be Professor Emeritus. To recap, he was first given emeritus or retired status without having been reinstated as a professor. Then he was reinstated as a professor and was given a normal emeritus status after that. He continued his work until he died in 1976. What did Friedrich Nietzsche mean by power? In his Will to Power, compiled posthumously in 1901. Nietzsche is more concerned with the power and strength of the individual than in the individual's control over others. Nietzsche believed that the world was in constant flux and that the only way living things could enjoy being alive was not by knowledge of ideal or unchanging entities, but by constantly increasing their own power. The will to live was for him identical to the will to power because existence is a continual struggle. The transmogrification of values by the overman would represent a future stage of this will to power in the form of new, successful life. Did Martin Heidegger owe a philosophical debt to Immanuel Kant? Very much so particularly in his phenomenological analysis of space and time. Like Immanuel Kant, 
1724 to 1804, Heidegger thought that both space and time were in the subjects as necessary preconditions for experience. But unlike Kant, Heidegger did not believe that space and time were necessary categories in the mind. Rather, they were ontological structures of human existence that became evident in the way Dasein concretely existed. What did Simone de Beauvoir mean by an ethics of ambiguity? Beauvoir expressed a disappointment with politics after World War II. And she addressed the importance of mass action and relations between political party leaders and their followers and colleagues. She applied Jean-Paul Sartre's, 1905-1980, existential philosophy to politics. Criticizing the spirit of seriousness that characterized those who did not take responsibility for their political actions as free individuals. Although Sartre had never written on ethics, she thought that ethical positions and decisions would arise from compelling passions and circumstances. The best interpretation of Beauvoir's The Ethics of Ambiguity, 1947 is not that ethics is itself ambiguous but that ethics is somewhat arbitrary from an existentialist perspective. Was Jean-Paul Sartre Jewish? This question is deeply embedded in the disputes among Sartre's closest followers that followed his death. Their disputes were not so much matters of philosophy as they were a competition. For who would inherit Sartre's legacy and be able to speak for him after his death? According to Benny Levy, a former Maoist who had been Sartre's secretary for several years and transcribed 40 hours of taped conversations in Hope Now. The 1980 interviews, 1996, Sartre expressed hope for the coming of the Messiah. What is Dossian? Dossian is Martin Heidegger's term for a human being. Its literal meaning is being there. Heidegger intended by this term to convey that human beings are not simple. Self-contained biological beings but that they are always concerned with things beyond their physical selves. With things in the world, other people, and the future. What was Martin Heidegger's theory of time? As with space, time, explained Heidegger, is a creation of Dossian based on its concern for things beyond its immediate self. Dossian in the mode of Tempi or Liddy even creates abstract or clock time because it is a goal-oriented being. Something that is not yet becomes located in the future. On the basis of the having been, which is the past. 
the immediacy of the present emerges from Dacian's concern about something in the future. As a structure of human existence, temporality thus temporalizes itself. This is Heidegger's terminology, and what he seems to mean is that when you think about the future, you think about how the present will be a memory to you then. People do this when they deliberately take photographs to create memories. Who was Maurice Merleau-Ponty? Maurice Merleau-Ponty, 1908-1961 Was an anti-empiricist who sought to reconstruct the world based on a phenomenology of human perception. He was influenced by Edmund Husserl, 1859-1938, was friends with Jean-Paul Sartre. 1905-1980 and continues to be of great interest to phenomenological philosophers of mind. His principal works are The Phenomenology of Perception, 1945. Numerous essays, and his unfinished The Visible and the Invisible. Who was Franz Brentano? Franz Brentano, 1837-1917, taught in Würzburg and at the University of Vienna. Influencing Austrian philosopher Alexius Menon, 1853-1920. Why did Martin Heidegger claim that existentialism was not a type of humanism? In going back to pre-Socratic thought, Heidegger concluded that the original concern of man or Dacian, in a cultural line that linked contemporary Germans to ancient Greeks, was being Heidegger believed that the pre-Socratics had only started to formulate the primary questions concerning being. When the Socratics introduced a subject-object kind of metaphysics that already foreclosed one kind of answer to the original question of being. Heidegger makes it clear to the reader that he does not know what this original question concerning being was. Indeed, he devoted his philosophical work to trying to reconstruct the question, thereby inviting readers to ponder the same problem he did, with no conclusive answer. In this sense, Heidegger provides an exercise in meditation. To those of his readers who take the time to understand him. Heidegger wrote much about what that question might be. Relying on a phenomenological intuition that language is the house of being. He did not mean by this the language of the they, or even the discourse of French existentialists. Such as Jean Paul Sartre, 1905 to 1980, with its insufficiently general concerns. Until the question of being could be formulated. The kind of humanism that existentialism could be could not even be properly imagined, according to Heidegger. What are some details of Sigmund Freud's life that led him to his work?
Freud was born in Freiburg, Germany, but raised in Vienna, Austria. He studied medicine at the University of Vienna, specializing in neurology. In 1886, Freud married Martha Bernays. They had six children, and the youngest, Anna, herself became a noted psychoanalyst. Freud's youngest son, Ernst, was the father of Lucy and Freud, the celebrated 20th century portrait painter. Biographers of Freud assess his family life as happy and stable. Providing much needed support for the controversy that swirled around his startling and original psychological theories. Freud's mentors J. M. Charcot and Joseph Brewer investigated hysteria, and Freud became interested in the psychological aspects of this disorder because hysterical patients have physical symptoms without underlying disease. Freud and Charcot published their clinical findings of how talk can change patients' ideas. As a treatment for hysteria, in their studies in hysteria, 1895. As Freud developed a sexual interpretation of the causes of hysteria, Brewer distanced himself from him. How are psychology and philosophy related? Up until the 19th century, no clear distinction was made between philosophy of mind and psychology. The science of psychology did not yet exist in its own right until the early 20th century. Early historical figures in the science of psychology, such as Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, are of interest to philosophers because their theories of the human mind changed ideas about human nature in ways that philosophers had to take into account. What was Martin Heidegger's theory of space? Dossian creates space by assigning proximity or distance to objects in the world with which it is concerned. And the space that results from existence in this way does not necessarily line up with abstract dimensions and distances. The eyeglasses on a person's nose, for example, are farther away to the wearer than the picture hanging on the wall that he or she looks through the glasses to see. Objects in space acquire a characteristic of being Ready to hand they are things that we use and manipulate. The ready to hand, although literally in space, has its real meaning through human action over time. For example, if you pick up a hammer, you intend to do something with it in the next few minutes. And you are doing that to achieve a goal after that, such as hanging a picture on the wall. What did the religious and humanist existentialists contribute? The religious existentialists reconciled Sartrean ideas of freedom with the Judaic Christian tradition. The humanist existentialists brought the more abstract aspects of existentialism into literature or developed them in different directions philosophically.
who was Alexius Manung. Alexius Manung, 1853-1920, was born in Lemberg, Austria, and studied philosophy with Franz Brentano. 1837-1917, who set him the task of reading David Hume, 1711-1776. This resulted in two early books on Hume, the first on abstraction and the second on relation which appeared as Hume study and in 1877 and 1882, respectively. Like Brentano, Meinung is considered an analytical phenomenologist. Unlike those phenomenologists. In the so-called continental tradition, he applied the rigors of logic to introspection. He established the Institute of Psychology in Graz, Austria, where he was a professor. Meinung is best known for his theory of objects and values. And his principal publication is on Assumptions, 1902. What was ironic about Maurice Merleau-Ponty's last lecture? Merleau-Ponty died suddenly of a stroke while preparing to give a lecture on René Descartes, 1596-1650. He repeatedly returned to Descartes' split between the mind and the body in composing his own philosophy. He did not accept the Cartesian split, but sought to address the mind and body as a united whole. Merleau-Ponty thought that a person's own body, le cor propra, should be in its personal, individual, lived reality, a scientific subject. It is one's own body that makes consciousness corporeal. He wrote, insofar as I have hands, feet, a body, I sustain around me intentions which are not dependent on my decisions and which affect my surroundings in a way that I do not choose. Clearly, Merleau-Ponty's stroke proves this point because it was not something he chose. But definitely something that conclusively affected not only his surroundings but the possibility of his even having those surroundings. What's ironic is that he made his point by having a stroke. Which is very different from making a philosophical argument. What was ironic about Maurice Merleau-Ponty's last lecture? Merleau-Ponty died suddenly of a stroke while preparing to give a lecture on René Descartes, 1596-1650. He repeatedly returned to Descartes' split between the mind and the body in composing his own philosophy. He did not accept the Cartesian split, but sought to address the mind and body as a united whole. Merleau-Ponty thought that a person's own body, le cor propra, should be in its personal, individual, lived reality, a scientific subject. It is one's own body that makes consciousness corporeal. He wrote, insofar as I have hands, feet, a body, I sustain around me intentions which are not dependent on my decisions and which affect my surroundings in a way that I do not choose. Clearly, Merleau-Ponty's stroke proves this point because it was not something he chose. 
but definitely something that conclusively affected not only his surroundings but the possibility of his even having those surroundings. What's ironic is that he made his point by having a stroke. Which is very different from making a philosophical argument. What are some facts about Maurice Merleau-Ponty's life and career? Merleau-Ponty's father was killed in World War I. He completed his philosophical studies at the École Normale Supérieure in 1930 and then taught in high schools throughout France. He wrote two dissertations for his doctorate and was given the chair of child psychology at the Sorbonne in 1949, next. He was made chair of philosophy at the Collège de France in 1952, with Jean-Paul Sartre. 1905-1980, he founded the journal Les Temps Modernes. But he resigned from the publication as editor, partly in objection to Sartre's subject-object dichotomy. Merleau-Ponty wrote about their dispute in Adventures of the Dialectic, 1955. Overall, Merleau-Ponty opposed dualisms and he also criticized self versus world ideas. He thought that the self was as much a body as a mind and that our bodies are always in the world. What are some facts about Maurice Merleau-Ponty's life and career? Merleau-Ponty's father was killed in World War I. He completed his philosophical studies at the École Normale. Supérieure in 1930 and then taught in high schools throughout France. He wrote two dissertations for his doctorate and was given the chair of child psychology at the Sorbonne in 1949, next. He was made chair of philosophy at the Collège de France in 1952, with Jean-Paul Sartre. 1905-1980, he founded the journal Les Temps Modernes. But he resigned from the publication as editor, partly in objection to Sartre's subject-object dichotomy. Merleau-Ponty wrote about their dispute in Adventures of the Dialectic, 1955. Overall, Merleau-Ponty opposed dualisms and he also criticized self versus world ideas. He thought that the self was as much a body as a mind and that our bodies are always in the world. What did Maurice Merleau-Ponty mean by a phenomenology of perception? Merleau-Ponty opposed the abstract natures of both empiricism, which generalized, and idealism, which denied the direct experience and existence of physical reality. He proclaimed that the perceiving mind is an incarnate mind. Meaning that it was in the body in the sense of being coincident with the body. Perception is a physical process involving eyes, ears, the nose, the hands, rather than only the mind. His focus was thus on the human body as a perceiving, living part of world. A position there too for much neglected in philosophical inquiry. According to Merleau-Ponty, 
perception is neither abstract nor scientific. Rather, all perception is lived, it is the experience of human beings in the world. Consciousness is, to use a later term, embodied and always engaged in perceiving the world. What is phenomenological about human experience is that what is perceived cannot be separated from how it is perceived or from how it is described. In conversation with Ferdinand de Saussure, 1857-1913, Merleau-Ponty composed the prose of the world. 1969 claiming that meaning is not determined by history but by the subject's actual experience in the world. Language is itself continually changing as a result of this experience. In The Visible and the Invisible Merleau-Ponty had intended to show how communication and thought can go beyond perception, but he died before completing that project. What did Maurice Merleau-Ponty mean by a phenomenology of perception? Merleau-Ponty opposed the abstract natures of both empiricism, which generalized, and idealism, which denied the direct experience and existence of physical reality. He proclaimed that the perceiving mind is an incarnate mind. Meaning that it was in the body in the sense of being coincident with the body. Perception is a physical process involving eyes, ears, the nose, the hands, rather than only the mind. His focus was thus on the human body as a perceiving, living part of world. A position there too for much neglected in philosophical inquiry. According to Merleau-Ponty, perception is neither abstract nor scientific. Rather, all perception is lived, it is the experience of human beings in the world. Consciousness is, to use a later term, embodied and always engaged in perceiving the world. What is phenomenological about human experience is that what is perceived cannot be separated from how it is perceived or from how it is described. In conversation with Ferdinand de Saussure, 1857-1913, Merleau-Ponty composed the prose of the world. 1969 claiming that meaning is not determined by history but by the subject's actual experience in the world. Language is itself continually changing as a result of this experience. In The Visible and the Invisible Merleau-Ponty had intended to show how communication and thought can go beyond perception, but he died before completing that project. What is the difference between critical theory and structuralism? There is no clear distinction of practice that practitioners of both schools of thought would accept. Many structuralists denied being structuralists and some Critical theorists were unaware of the term critical theory. But from the standpoint of a reader, it may help to keep in mind that both structuralism and critical theory provide analyses of society that need not be accepted by the members of society being analyzed. The term critical theory is associated with the Frankfurt School. 
which developed the 20th century version of scholarly Marxism. The term structuralism refers to a study of mental structures in society. Critical theory seeks to provide analyses that further progressive and egalitarian social goal. Structuralism also uses critical theory. Although the members and followers of the Frankfurt School were not narrowly political, their Marxist legacy tended to point them in certain political directions. While structuralists might have shared certain goals with Marxian critical theorists, their subjects were other social institutions besides government. They also took up Freudian psychology and were instrumental in laying the foundations for a new focus on language and symbols as an important philosophical subject. In some quarters, given the successors or intellectual heirs of structuralism, language and the symbolic order became the only intellectual subject. That is, the structuralists paved the way for intellectual postmodernism, which is also known as post-structuralism. What is the difference between critical theory and structuralism? There is no clear distinction of practice that practitioners of both schools of thought would accept. Many structuralists denied being structuralists and some critical theorists were unaware of the term critical theory. But from the standpoint of a reader, it may help to keep in mind that both structuralism and critical Theory provide analyses of society that need not be accepted by the members of society being analyzed. The term critical theory is associated with the Frankfurt School, which developed the 20th century version of scholarly Marxism. The term structuralism refers to a study of mental structures in society. Critical theory seeks to provide analyses that further progressive and egalitarian social goal. Structuralism also uses critical theory. Although the members and followers of the Frankfurt School were not narrowly political, their Marxist legacy tended to point them in certain political directions. While structuralists might have shared certain goals with Marxian critical theorists, their subjects were other social institutions besides government. They also took up Freudian psychology and were instrumental in laying the foundations for a new focus on language and symbols as an important philosophical subject. In some quarters, given the successors or intellectual heirs of structuralism. Language and the symbolic order became the only intellectual subject. That is, the structuralists paved the way for intellectual postmodernism, which is also known as post-structuralism. <laughs> 